In this episode of The Great Outdoors, we have a tremendous variety of stories for you. First off, we go over here to Cal in South Australia, where we have a look at a $20 million industry. We look at the mining of Australian jade. And then, in Victoria, we go up into the highlands here to Mount Hotham, to the Alpine Tourist Resort. But when we go there with our cameras, the weather's really bad. In fact, it's some of the worst weather on record. But people still go skiing. We take a look at downhill skiing, as well as cross-country skiing. Then we go to Queensland, to the little town of Sanford here, to have a look at a different form of skiing. This is grass skiing. And while we're in Queensland, we go down to Moreton Bay and have a look at light aircraft. They're called minimum aircraft. You can build these aircraft yourself and you can fly them without a license and that's a lot of fun. This small sleepy town on the shores of Spencer Gulf in South Australia has one commodity with such enormous potential that it could change the destiny of the whole area and in fact bring world fame to the quiet town. The small fishing village of Cowell, 100 kilometres south of Wyala, on the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia, is like any other seaside village, except for one thing. One quarter of the world's jade comes from here. Deposits of precious jade worth millions of dollars are being mined by the Cowell Jade Company in the hills a short distance from town. We're going to have a look at Australia's only commercial jade deposits with Graham Robertson and Harry Schiller. Nephrite jade is so abundant in the hills around Cal that the early settlers used bowlers of it to hold their wire netting fences in place. It takes about three quarters of an hour to reach jade country. Gray Robertson, managing director of Cal Jade, and the jade's discoverer, 75-year-old Harry Schiller, lead me to a typical jade outcrop. Schiller demonstrates the natural xylophone qualities of this outcrop. The tough nature of the rock sends a pick bouncing back. Is this a typical outcrop of jade, would you say here? Yes, this is rather a little bit more spectacular, I think, than most of the, out the outcrops that we've got. It is one that we hope to keep for all time as an illustration of the type of um, outcrops that occurred in the country. This is not the original deposit that I first found, but this is one of the first ones that attracted my attention, mainly on account of the very tough nature of the stone and the unusual formation and the colour of the outside of the stone, and that is why I had it analysed. How long ago was this? It's the latter part of 1965. The Nephrite Jade Province, as it's known, covers an area of nine square kilometres and has 92 outcrops. The Cal deposit is important as it's one of the world's few jade deposits of significant size with year-round accessibility. The Cal Jade Company has a number of areas that it's mining and Graham takes us to a typical open-cut mine. Black Jade, the rarest colour and comparable with the world's best. It is, in fact, a dark olive green. When this first uh, black jade was found, the surface expression was only a boulder on the surface up there. We've now mined, I guess, to a depth of some six or seven metres. You can see clearly in the quarry face the definition of the jade lens as it develops at depth. This is only one of over 90 recorded pods within the Cal Nephrite Jade Province. A pod being the descriptive word to describe the way the Nephrite Jade forms. It's almost 
cigar shape, pod shape. The extent of all the deposits is not yet known, in that only two or three have been worked extensively. None of them have yet been worked out, so the potential for the tonnage within the province is certainly very, very exciting. To bring out the colour, Graham pours water over the rough jade. Bad quality jade. There's the contact, there's the jade, there's the marble. Very good example actually of the contact. Marble and jade are usually found together. Beautiful. Very good piece. This looks like a good piece, Mike, but it's very deceptive and you can't tell until you really cut it. It can easily be mistaken. Well, can we see it being cut at the factory? Sure. While we're at the mine, we take the opportunity to load a couple of good-looking specimens into the truck. They're heavy, didn't they? Look, aren't they? Oh, they're very they're deceptive. Heavy. The company's headquarters is in Cowl itself. It's here that the cutting and polishing is carried out by local people. Hilary Carmody loads the most promising lump into the huge diamond saw. It takes an hour or so to cut through the chunk of jade and then comes the moment of truth. Has it been worth all the effort? There can be hidden cracks and faults that cannot be seen until it's cut. There is a crack in it, but it's still quite a good piece. To make jade jewellery, the shape of the finished article is scribed on a slice of jade. Hillary then cuts the rough shapes on a smaller diamond saw. The roughs are then handed over to Anthony Hansen, who carries out the final shaping on a lathe. There are many painstaking hours of work to cut and shape the hard jade into delicate items of jewellery. To get a smooth shining finish, there are four stages of polishing, starting with tin oxide and ending up with a leather buffer. When the polished jade is set in a silver setting, you have a stunning and unique piece of jewellery made from Australian jade. In the showroom, Harry Schiller shows Pat the varieties of colour in the cowl jade. It ranges from the black jade right through the various greens and other colours to a moss effect. The moss jade makes particularly interesting patterns when cut and polished. Fine grain black jade is particularly good for carving miniatures. Most of these examples were crafted by Hilary Carmody. The South Australian Mines Department a few years ago estimated the value of the Cal Jade deposit at a conservative $20 million. One of the most interesting aspects of Cal Jade is that they currently supply about one quarter of the annual world jade demand of 700 tonnes. With the major buyer being New Zealand, they also sell to India and the United States. Wealth and beauty like this, from a country that's dry and harsh like so much of Australia's great outdoors.
Parental guidance.